So we're going to continue in the book of Psalms this morning. In fact, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Psalm 18. We're going to spend our time there this morning. And uh, before we just jump in there, I mean, I, I just so appreciated last week uh, being able to sit and, and uh, worship. Uh, but but uh, here, uh, Jerry, uh, give us a challenge as a church, but a challenge as fathers and as, as individuals. I, I knew Jerry was a, a preacher who used props. Okay, what I did not understand, what I did not know before last week is that you needed to put a cleaning fee connected to him coming and preaching. Okay, Um, if you missed last week, he brought a bucket and I just thought it was the prop. I didn't know at the end of the service, he'd flip the bucket over and dirt and acorns would fall here. I and uh, so I forgot to read the small print. I won't do that again. I won't do that again. But uh, it was such a joy. Uh, last week, and uh, what a word he brought to us and, and encouraged us with. So I want to look at Psalm 18. David is the author. David wrote so many of the Psalms, and I think this Psalm gives us a glimpse into his, uh, his life, but his thinking, to, especially towards the end of his life. You know, we, we love this Psalm. It just kind of resonates with us. It connects with us. Uh, the things that are said, you're like, yeah, I, I need that. I, I know that. I connect with that. For example, he starts off, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. In two verses, really just one verse, we have eight characteristics that David uses to describe his God. I mean, strength, rock, fortress, deliverer, refuge, shield, salvation, stronghold. And, and if you um, have lived any time, you're like, I, I need those. I connect with those. I, I uh, am drawn into that when someone says, this is the character, these are the characteristics of my God. He is my rock and my refuge and my shield and my salvation. Now, in, in, in the Bible I'm preaching from, and I think it's going to be in yours too, if you go up above verse 1, above verse 1, okay, for my, mine, it's italicized. It's not even a verse number. Here's what mine says. For the director of music of David, the servant of the Lord, he sang to the Lord the words of the song when the Lord delivered him from the hand of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. He said, and then starts the chapter. In this chapter, don't know if you know this, this chapter in its entirety, From beginning to end, including those italicized words I just read, you can find in 2 Samuel chapter 22. It's scripture in 2 Samuel chapter 22, and then we have it again in Psalm 18. And in 2 Samuel 22, it's at the end of David's life. David's life is coming to a close, coming to an end, and he pens these words, he's writing these words. It's like he's looking back over a life lived. And as he's looking back over a life lived, he's drawing some lessons learned. He's drawing out some some truths that he has found to be in place, that he's found to be consistent and constant in his life. And he puts them in in this psalm for us to to digest, in fact, for us to hold on to. David lived his life and looked back and he's like, man, here are some things that I'm seeing. Let me just share them with you. So with that in mind, let's start. We're going to start back at verse 1. I love you, Lord, my strength. By the way, I just love the way he starts this. Out of everything that he has experienced in life, out of all the lessons he's learned, he comes to this conclusion, and he states it at the very beginning. I love you, God. If you know the life of David, you know it wasn't an easy life. You know it wasn't a life of ease or a life of pleasure or a life of uh, um, no struggle. It wasn't a struggle-free life, but he says, you know what? I've come to a place. I love you, God. My strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my Stronghold. Now, if you were a king and you went to battle often, these words would connect with you on a different level than they probably would connect with me. No king, no fighting, no battles. But if you were a king and you're leading your troops into battle, 
being strong is so important. You don't want to, to be a picture of weakness. You want to be a picture of strength. Fortress is so important, and a fortress is, is something in which you can defend yourself when you need to be defended, when the enemy attacks. A refuge is so important because there are going to be those times where your army needs to be re- take a rest and, and get rested up and find that refuge. Deliverer, salvation. There are going to be times when you're in battle that you're going to need, need to be delivered. You're, need, you're going to need to find that rescue, that salvation that, that's going to need to come your way. You, you can go through those words, and as a king going into battle, you can say, every one of those is so important. And I've seen them lived out in my life. God, you are. You are my strength. You are my rock. You're my deliverer, my refuge horn of salvation, my stronghold. Just from the beginning, he says, God, I'm praising you. But he continues, look at verse 3. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I have been saved from my enemies. The cords of death entangled me. The tor- uh, torments of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me, and the snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called to you, Lord. I cried to my God for help from his temple. He heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. So David is reliving and and rethinking and reflecting upon some of the events that he's experienced in his life. And and, and some of these events, the events he's talking about in these verses, are, are not pleasant events. In fact, death was at the door. Did you catch that in verse 4? The cords of death entangled me. That doesn't sound good. The torments of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me and the snares of death confronted me. He's talking about times in which his life was in danger. He's talking about events where it could be life or death and death looked like it was going to be the more probable answer. That's what he's talking about. And then he says, in those moments, I cried out to God for help. In those moments, I cried out to God for deliverance, for rescue, for salvation. God, I need you. God, I, I need you. Come, help me. Maybe you've been there. At the end of your rope, your back's against the wall. You have nowhere else to turn, and it doesn't look good any way you look. And you cry out to God, God, I need you. That's David right here. Now, verses 7 through 15, David's using a poetic device, basically saying all of creation heard his prayer. I mean, the clouds thundered and the thunder happened and lightning happened. And I mean, things were going on saying God was hearing my prayer. But in verse 16, we actually hear the response to this prayer. He, God, reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. So David's talking about a time in which death was at his door. He cried out to God, and what do you know? God came in and delivered him. God came into the rescue. God came in and brought salvation and life where death was what was, he was looking at. And he just says, I mean, I praise you, God. As I look back, I see your hand in this. In the events of my life, you were there. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's good. That's fine. That's great for David. He cried out to God, God heard him, responded, delivered him, and rescued him, and he is saved. Great, but I'm just telling you where I am right now. I've been crying out to God, and I'm just not hearing him. I don't hear a response. I'm hurting. I'm broken. I've got scars and wounds, and and I don't even know if I've got the strength to make it another day. And I'm crying out to God for help, so that he would be my strength and my rock and my fortress. And I'm just not hearing him respond. So it's good and fine that you can talk about David in this psalm. He's looking back and saying, praise God, he was there. He came through. He 
delivered me, but I'm not sensing that God is doing that for me. Which I would say two things. One is, don't forget, David is at the end of his life looking back. And as he's looking back, he's able to start connecting the dots. And perhaps he wasn't able to connect the dots in the moment. Perhaps when he's looking back, perhaps he remembers times in which he was like, God, I don't know where you are. Why aren't you showing up? But when he's at the end of his life, he's like, oh, you were there all the time. I just couldn't see it. And so my question is, did David ever experience one of those moments in which he says, God, where are you? God, why aren't you responding? Why aren't you answering? Why are my prayers just falling short? And the answer to that question is, yes, there is. Turn back to Psalm 13. See, Psalm 13 is a psalm that David wrote as well. And and I'm just going to read the two verses of it. And and, and as I read these two verses, you're going to realize this sounds completely different than the Psalm 18. How long, O God, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Sounds like a completely different author. Sounds like someone is in the heat of the situation, the heat of the battle, the heat of being rescued, and he's crying out to God, but God's not coming through. That's what Psalm 13 sounds like. And Psalm 18 is... David, at the end of his life, looking back and say, saying, oh man, you were there all the time. I didn't see it, but you were there. See, it's easier to, uh, to look back and connect the dots that God was pr- present, God was faithful, God was giving you what you needed when you needed it, when you're looking back. But, but when you're in it, perspective changes and when you're in it you can't see anything but what's right in front of you and and you don't see God coming to deliver you you see God doing nothing I I think I shared with you a story uh, of when I was between my seventh and eighth grade year that I went on a 50 mile backpacking trip and it's through scouting and, and if you ask me about that trip I would tell you it was an awesome trip I mean, it was a, a crazy good trip. I got stories to tell, and I'd probably just start telling you stories. Now, that's what would happen if you asked me that today. But if you asked me how that trip was going on Wednesday night of that week, I would have said, this is the most horrible decision I've ever made. <laughs> because Wednesday we woke up, and we got out of our tents, and it started raining. The problem was, we were already behind schedule. It wasn't like we could try to wait the rain out. We had to make up time. And so our guides for the the week said, guys, we we have to hike. So get ready, let's go. And so we did. And it rained for eight hours that day. Can I tell you, at the end of the day, at the end of the eight hours, I was not a happy camper. We got to their camp, and we had to set up tent. By the way, everything was wet. Everything was wet. We had to set up our tent. It was wet. I don't know if I told you that. (laughs) We had to cook dinner. First, we had to start a fire. Have you ever tried to start a fire when the wood is completely wet? And they say the Boy Scout code is that you never start a fire using Girl Scout water. Now, Girl Scout water is common fuel, okay? And I already got in trouble by Girl Scout. I'm sorry. Sorry, that was just what we said in the day. I'm sure they don't say that anymore. But that's what we said in the day. And so we had a choice in the matter. Do we stick to our code and try to start this fire with wet wood? We needed to fire just to heat up and to cook food. Or do we break the code and we do we use Girl Scout water? I'm here to tell you right now, I broke the code. But I got a fire. Can I tell you, that night, I'd have told you this is the most miserable trip I've been on. 
But looking back, a great trap. Sometimes we can't see all that God is doing around us because we're just right in the middle. In the heat, the battle. So David is looking backwards and saying, Oh, I remember that prayer. How long ago, God? Are you going to forget me? But he was actually there. And he was actually moving. And he was working things to a place where he was coming. Just not in my time. But now I see it. And he was my deliverer and my rock and my refuge. Well, let's continue on. Verse 20. The Lord has dealt with me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he has rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord. I am not guilty of turning from my God. All his laws are before me. I have not turned away from his decrees. I have been blameless before him. And have kept myself from sin. And the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. So what else David does and what else David has recognized and has noticed, and he he is able to draw a conclusion here, is as he's looking back on his life, he realizes, he sees that God's blessings and God's rewards and God's favor is connected more often than not connected to our faithfulness and our righteousness. And righteousness means just right living, living in a right way according to God's design. That when that happens, God's blessing comes to that situation and to those people. And David could tell you what happens when you don't live that way. And David wasn't perfect. David made his mistakes. That is, uh, to say the least, And so he understood that the fact that when you don't live according to God's ways, when you live life your way, when you do things your way instead of God's ways, then you're outside of God's blessings. In fact, discipline usually comes in in those areas. And so David's just connecting the dots that that if I'm living life in a faithful way, clean hands, I'm going to be living righteously as best I can, God's favor and blessing and rewards tend to go in in that, that direction. Now, what David is not saying is that God's a genie in the bottle. He's not saying that we can manipulate God. He's not saying that that we can uh, uh, snap our fingers and God's going to come at our pleasure and do what we want to do. That's not what David is saying either. But David is saying, here's the trend that I've noticed. When you live life in a way that honors God, God's blessings and rewards tend to show up in your life. And if you live life in rebellion against God, discipline typically comes. Look at verse 25. He just continues to echo this. To the faithful you show yourself faithful. To the blameless you show yourself blameless. To the pure you show yourself pure. But to the devious you show yourself shrewd. You save the humble, but you bring low those whose eyes are arrogant and haughty and proud. He's just echoing what he's connecting the dots here. To the faithful, you show yourself faithful. To the blameless, you show yourself blameless. To to the righteous, you show show yourself as blessings and rewards. But to to the shrewd, to the rebellious, you bring down the prideful. Verse 30 sums it up. He says, "As as as for God, His way is perfect. The Lord's way is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in Him. In other words, David is saying, I trust in God. And I think if we could just sit down and talk with David for a while, David would tell us situation after situation after situation where his trust was tested and his faith was tested. And he's come through all of that. And he's to a point now he can say, I can say with great confidence, I trust God. His way's perfect. And I've been on the ups and I've been through the downs. And I can tell you, I trust God. When the battle's happening, I trust God. When the chips are down, I trust God. When the sickness comes, I trust God. When there's relationship turmoil, I trust God. When I'm just in a spiritual dry season of my life, I trust God. 
His way's perfect, and I might not be able to see exactly what he's doing and how he's working, but I've come to a place I can say, as David says, I just trust you, God. Continuing, look at verse 32. It is God who arms me with strength and keeps my way secure. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He causes me to stand on the heights. He trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. You make your saving help my shield. Your right hand sustains me. Your help has made me great. You provide a broad path for my feet so that my ankles do not give way. What's interesting is David at the end of his life, looking back on a life lived, he recognizes that God has been orchestrating events where he's come to the rescue. He's been David's deliverer. He's been David's salvation and stronghold. And that that God has given him what he's needed in the battle. That's what he says here. He says, I didn't do any of this on myself, by myself. I didn't do any of this on my own. When, when I came out and fight, fight Goliath, it, it wasn't me. Let me just tell you, it was God in me. He gave me the ability to throw a stone. He gave me the courage to stand up. And when I was fighting battles and I didn't think that the victory was possible, that God gave him the wisdom, God gave him direction, God gave him the, the ability to do what needed to be done for victory to be had. David is saying, none of this is me. All of this is God. None of this is me. And I think sometimes I am guilty of living life saying, look at me. Look at what I did. Look at what I can do. And God is saying, I gave you every ability you have to do what you're doing. You should be going through life saying, look at God. What he's doing. What he's given me to do. That's what David says. Hmm. I, hadn't even been able to, I wouldn't even be able to pull back a bow if it was not for God giving me the ability. All God. All God. And so David is just doing a life reflection here. And he's saying, when I was at my deepest down, rock bottom, God was there. And God brought deliverance and God brought salvation, a refuge. And I've realized that as I live life and, 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 and if I was faithful, God showered blessings upon me and rewarded me. If I was blameless, if I was righteous, God was there to, 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 to reward the life lived in a way that honors him. But, but when I was sinful and I was rebellious, I also realized that was drawn away from me and, and discipline came. And just so you think that I'm not the great king, I, I, it's all God. And so here's how he ends the psalm. Verse 46. The Lord lives. And praise be to my rock. Exalted be God my Savior. He is the God who avenges me, who subdues nations under me, who saves me from my enemies. You exalted me above my foes from a violent man. You rescued me. Therefore, I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing the praises of of your name. He ends it like he starts it. God, I just praise you for all that I now can connect the dots and all that I see. And I just have to stop and say, God, you are to be praised. And I will praise you above all nations. I will bring my praise to you. So where are you? That's my question. And some of you you're right in the middle of the storm. Or some of you are right in the middle of the uh, rock bottom. You've been crying out to God and you've been praying to God in distress and you just haven't got an answer. You just haven't felt God move. You haven't seen God deliver you. You're saying, God, how long is this going to take place? And some of you are right there. And to you, I want, I want you to hear me. And David would say it. David did say it. <clears throat> He's right there. And you might not be able to see it, see him. And you might not be able to see what he's doing, but, but he has not abandoned you. He has not forgotten you. 
He's walking with you. He's, he's providing for you. He's equipping you. He's right there. And may we all be able to say, on David's word, I praise God. In the storm, I praise God. In victory, I praise God. In sickness, I praise God. God, I love you. And you're my strength. You're my rock, my fortress. You're my deliverer. God, you're my rock. I take refuge in you. You're my shield and my salvation, my stronghold. God, you live. And praise be to my rock, exalted God, you are my Savior. I will praise you. Among all the nations, I will praise you. I will sing praises to your name. Father, we come to you. And you know where we are. You know our hurt. You know our scars. You know what's going on before we even pray and ask. You are intimately involved and concerned about every detail of our lives. You love us. You care for us. And so, Father, would you just remind us today that even if we can't see you working the way we are wanting you to work, you're still there. And there's some folks here that need to hear that today. Remind us you're faithful. You reward those who are faithful. You reward those who live righteously. You reward, you reward those who live in a way that honors you. And even in the tough times, we want to live life that way. Father, we want to come to a place where we say, God, I trust you. I trust you. Because of that, I praise you and worship you. It's in Christ's name I pray.